Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite where I... This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I, I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, why that's so, why that's so, why that's so, why that's so. Greetings, dear listeners, and welcome to yet another episode of Tales from Astlantis. We are your hosts, Curly Tlapoyawa. And Ruben Ariano Tlacateca. So I'm excited about today's episode. Um, I was going through uh, some of our older articles and I pulled this one up because, as you know, I'm, I'm helping out now with the uh, Sacred Springs powwow. I'm doing a lot of the uh, the graphic design. I designed the T-shirt. Oh, you did? Um, yeah. Okay. And I'm I'm helping to uh, do a lot of the um, social media, the promotion, and uh, you know, just getting word out, trying to recruit dancers and stuff. So I was like, man, Ruben wrote an article about this, and so I wanted to refamiliarize myself mm-hmm. more with the the powwow. So I checked it out, and I was like, damn, this is this is a good piece. Well, you know. It's it's been cited a couple of times in academic articles. I don't know, maybe at the end, maybe you can get into them. But like one that was published in uh, probably 2018 or something. Uh, no, 2022 Damn. this year, actually, the beginning of the year. Um, someone cited that article in, in a, uh, or that blog article in, in an academic article. And then back in 2018... Someone cited it in their master's thesis nice. about danza. So, so maybe we can, yeah. we can talk about that at the end, see if there's anything else to add to the conversation on these two articles. So uh, just to give some, some uh, background on the article and uh, today's episode, I'm going to um, provide some, some background information. This episode is based on a blog article, a reflection that my co-host Ruben Ariano Tlacateca did back in 2017 of that year's Sacred Springs powwow held in San Marcos, Texas. The article can still be found on the mexica.org website for those interested. We'll also include a link in the show notes. Since 2010, the Indigenous Cultures Institute and the Miyakan Garza Band of Coahuiltecans has organized, hosted, and sponsored a yearly powwow in San Marcos, the Sacred Springs Powwow. Even during the pandemic shutdown of 2020 and 2021, they found a way to keep it going. Like all of us, they had to get creative, and by using the pandemic protocol tools of video conferencing and streaming, they were able to continue the tradition without skipping a beat. Regular listeners of the podcast have heard us talk about the ICI and the Miyakan Garzas, but in case you haven't, we encourage you to go to the show archives and listen to the wonderful conversation we had with Dr. Mario Garza, who is the elder of the Miyakan Garza band and a tireless fighter for the repatriation of Native American remains and artifacts. Our conversation with him is premium episode number four, entitled Defending the Ancestors. So, 
In this reflection, Rubin briefly discusses a bit of his personal history pertaining to his early years walking down uh, what is called the Red Road or Danza Azteca and Mexicayot and how these themes intersected in his life. Although not without its critics, as a danzante and proud indigenous Chicano, the 2017 Sacred Springs powwow was an exciting time. In retrospect, one can interpret what was done as a logical progression and evolution of the powwow, one that has for decades offered space for danzantes to showcase their tradition, but almost always as a sideshow. In the view of ourselves and many others who've lived this lifestyle, the time for better inclusion is long overdue. The pandemic put a pause on the momentum, and we hope that as things return to normal, we can pick up where we left off. And now we present Aztecas at the Pow Wow. It was summer and the year was 2001. Still a young man, I had just completed my first year as a danza neophyte, and I was extremely excited to have finally found my place, my cultural calling within Mexicayo. Having spent my teenage years becoming politicized during the brief resurgence of Chicanismo in the early 1990s, I had made the full transition from being a proud mestizo to identifying as an indio. But I wasn't just any generic Indian. Convinced of my Mexicanidad, I was now a proud Mexica. My eyes had been opened, and wearing my indigeneity on my sleeve, I proselytized and handed out Mexica Eagle Society literature everywhere I went with the same zealotry as someone who was born again. My approach was driven by indigenous ideology, and my message was drowned in the noise of modernity. Very few people I approached ever showed the remotest interest in my news of indigenous redemption, but that did little to deter my implacable efforts. I strongly held that through sheer determination, Mexicayot would eventually spread throughout Aztlan. I don't exactly remember when it happened, but my indigenous activism led me to a public school event where a group of natives sat around a large drum and were singing their lungs off. They were what are known in powwow circles as a southern drum a drumming-slash-singing style that is distinguished by its tenor vocals and slower beats as opposed to the northern style, which is higher-pitched and a bit faster. The drummers consisted mainly of individuals who belonged to the Kiowa and Comanche tribes with a couple of mixed Chicano natives for good measure. As a danzante, I was immediately drawn to the drum. I approached the group with intense curiosity, and they kindly invited me to sit with them at the drum. I introduced myself as an indigenous Mexicano, a Mexica, but the skeptical Indians only saw a Mexican in front of them. Whether it was the Chaquita bracelet and the broad-brimmed straw hat with the native patterned band that I wore which invited acceptance remains a mystery to me. Regardless of the reason, I spent the next five years on the powwow trail with that group while juggling work, relationships, political activism, and danza. I eventually left the group when it began to fracture and because I became frustrated with the identity politics that govern many powwows. Plus, I had started attending community college that year and leaving the group freed up time that I could now dedicate to my studies. I recall my time with the group fondly and cherish the memories immensely. During my tenure, I learned how to drum in the Southern tradition and sing as good as the rest of the group. I also gained the respect of the core membership, but that did not translate to the acceptance from the greater Indian community at large. A particular incident at a powwow seared itself into my memory, and it served to convince me at the time that pan-Indigenous unity was tenuous when it came to coalition building between Indians of the Anglophone and Hispanophone spheres. Of course, I have since realized that my personal experience isn't emblematic of all such relationships. In any case, during a break at that particular powwow, as I made my way to get refreshments, I was approached by a dancer who was curious as to what tribe I belonged to. The conversation went something like this. Uh, what tribe are you? 
asked the curious power attendee. And I responded, I'm Mexica. Oh, and where are they from? He followed. We're from Mexico, I said. Ah, you're one of those. As he mumbled and walked off. And with that, my indigeneity was called into question and dismissed at the same time. This was not an isolated incident, for I'd had many other similar encounters before, but this one was different. I went back to my seat at the center drum, and as I sat there digesting what had just happened, that's when I had an epiphany. I dreamt of one day organizing a powwow for danzantes, aztecas, and other indigenous peoples from south of the border. I envisioned having a great gathering that was not solely for ceremonial purposes, as is customary in the danza community, but rather having a competition that honored and celebrated the best among us. In other words, what I dreamed of was a powwow that celebrated the dances of Anahuac and Abiyala. For many years, I spoke about this to whoever showed interest, and then one day, the right people listened to my crazy idea. I was still a graduate student working on my dissertation when I met Dr. Mario Garza and his wife, Maria Rocha, members of the Miaca and Garza Band of Coabaltecans and founders of the Indigenous Cultures Institute in San Marcos, Texas. I met them in 2011. My research dealt with Chicana and Chicano indigeneity, so their experience proved instrumental to my investigation given their history advocating for ethnic Mexican indigenous identity. More importantly, unlike myself and those I surrounded myself with, they identified not with the Mexica, but rather with their indigenous Texas ancestors, the Coahuiltecans. I knew Chicanas and Chicanos like them were out there, for I had met danzantes who identified as Coahuiltecans since my very first danza medicine ceremony in my first year as a danzante. Back then, the Texas danza groups were a lot more cohesive than they are today, and they would gather yearly in San Antonio at the old missions to celebrate El Dia de los Muertos and the Mexica New Year. The missions were available to us because of the many years of Coahuiltec and Mexica coalition activism in that fiesta city. They had petitioned and organized to have the church and government officials open the historic missions for indigenous ceremonial use. But San Antonio wasn't the only place where Coahuiltecans were active. Just northeast of there, in San Marcos, Coahuiltecans were also actively making inroads in the native community. In 2010, after many years of lobbying the local authorities and institutions, the Miyakan Garzas finally achieved their goal of bringing the powwow ceremony back to their community after a 15-year absence. Over the years, the Miyakan Garzas accepted Michael Puli and Danza Group into their sacred circle and powwow ceremonies, and a strong bond formed between our respective Coahuiltecan and Mexica communities. At some point, I shared my idea of a danza powwow with the Miyakan Garzas, an idea they found exciting and in line with their own interests. The Sacred Springs powwow had long included danzantes in the grand entry and gave them their own time slot to showcase their dance tradition. They strongly felt that danzantes had just as every right to participate in the powwow as any other indigenous person. In discussion with the Miyakan Garzas, I expressed my biting criticism of how danzantes are usually relegated to the powwow margins. As a proud danzante, I had long grown tired of danza being disrespected as if it were merely a low-budget traveling circus act solely there for the purpose of entertainment while the crowds break for the fry bread and the Indian taco stands. Although not surprised, I was pleased that they agreed with me. As an aside, I must note that The juxtaposition of the words Indian and taco has always puzzled me, (laughs) as if tacos aren't indigenous to begin with. I know. I always tell people, all tacos are Indian tacos. (laughs) (laughs) Hashtag, all tacos are Indian tacos. But this one's real Indian taco. Yeah. I also shared with the Mia Cangarzas my complicated experience as a powwow drummer and my dream of someday having a danza powwow. They were very receptive and showed great interest in my idea. Our fleeting discussion those many years ago sowed the seeds for the historic event that transpired at the 7th Annual Sacred Springs powwow held on October 14th through the 15th back in 2017. As far as we knew, the very first Aztec dance competition at a powwow anywhere took place that Sunday the 15th. 
there were four winners in four categories, women's, men's, girls, and boys. This was a group effort involving the Mia Can Garza band, the ICI, and dansantes from all over Texas. I should note that my danza group has been a part of the Sacred Springs Pow for several years, so when the Mia Can Garza approached us in 2016 to help with their plans to incorporate a danza competition into the Pow we were delighted and jumped at the idea. Finally, I thought to myself, my dream is becoming a reality. In preparation for this historic event, myself, our danza chief Evelio Chichiltico at Flores and other Calpulli members collaborated in developing a procedure for judging danzantes in a powwow competition. Admittedly, for a while we weren't sure if it was remotely possible to even entertain the idea given the philosophical reservations that some dancers might have, but we managed to put together a guideline that accounted for the sensibilities of individual dancers and the original variations of each group, kind of like rounding up cats almost. In the end, I was honored to be elected as one of three judges, and I must admit that it was a surreal moment for me. At the time, it had been over a decade since I was an active Southern style drummer and since my epiphany, and now I was witnessing history unfolding right before my eyes. It was a proud moment to bear witness, not just to the very first Aztec dance competition at a powwow, but also to have taken an active role in developing and judging it. Let that sink in for a minute. For the first time ever, Aztec dancers had their own slot in a major powwow where they didn't simply dance while people ate dinner. They actually competed and the winners were recognized and rewarded like any other competitive dancer. Hopefully this is just the beginning of more to come. Now that we have seen that it's completely viable to have danza competitions, it's not that far-fetched to imagine an entire powwow comprised of danzantes aztecas, including indigenous traditions from the southern hemisphere as well as traditions from the north that are not generally included in a traditional powwow. Yes, it takes money to put on events like these, but it also takes, as we say in Chicano land, ganas, and enough people who share the vision to achieve this goal. In conclusion, and on behalf of Kabuli Tonalpili, Mitotilistli, Yao Yolotli, let me say that we are grateful to Dr. Mario Garza, his wife Maria Rocha, the Indigenous Cultures Institute, and the entire Miyakan Garza Band of Coahuiltecans for allowing this momentous event to happen at their Sacred Springs powwow. The Garzas have had and continue to have a lifelong commitment to promoting and advancing Chicana Chicano indigeneity, and with this, they have demonstrated that they not only talk the talk, but most definitely walk the walk. While a full-fledged danza powwow is still many years in the future, I look forward to seeing more Azteca competitions at the Sacred Springs powwow. That's really cool, man. I, I can imagine uh, being there when that happened for the first time. Because it's like you're saying, I, I go to, you know, and I don't go to a lot of powwows. I've only been to a handful of powwows. You've gone to way more than, than I have. But it was always kind of a little, you know, it was a drag to see, you know, well, and now here are the Aztec dancers and everybody just kind of breaks and goes and eats while the danzantes are dancing their hearts out, you yeah. know, because you want that acceptance, right? You want that validation of other indigenous peoples and to be like, oh, right on, we're going to dance at this powwow. And then you go there and like everybody bounces right, right. To, to go get in line yeah. for food. And it doesn't help either. That, that And this is one of the criticisms that I have of like um, when, when dancer groups are showcasing danza when they're at an event. Because of the, the, the strictures of the danza, everyone always feels compelled to to sort of um, do the, sh the demonstration of the danza almost like in a ceremonial fashion where you always have the mm -hmm. one, the, the, the tercera palabra come out and, and you know, kind of uh, select the next dancer and then they have to do their permiso and it just prolongs the danza longer than it should. Because, yeah. And I keep thinking to myself when I'm seeing this, 
This is not a ceremony. This is a, you're doing a demonstration. There's no need to do that. Yeah. And people begin to, after a while, you, you lose people because it's like, oh, they're just doing the same thing over again. Oh, here's this person. Yeah. And and one of the things that, that I exactly. brought up to Tijil Tikuat, you know, Bansa uh, over here in Dallas, um, this was just recent and we haven't really had uh, a chance to like dig into it to get the the idea in such a way where we can begin to even do anything towards achieving it but i was thinking remember uh, uh what was his name the the chicano that passed away recently the uh chui negrete remember yeah. did, did you ever yeah. see him in person yeah the last yeah. time that i saw him was at, at a knox conference and i think it was just north of houston i forget the name of the little community college that was out there and uh this was some you know maybe f- four or five years ago something like that before he passed he was there and you know if you saw him like people that, that remember chui like he always had a guitar and songs and a story to tell. And he would like he would be on stage and he would be telling the story of the Chicano people through songs, through poetry. And and I'm thinking maybe maybe I'm not saying all dancantes, but maybe danza when we're doing events in public it doesn't always have to be just everyone taking a turn dancing like if they were in a ceremony. Maybe mm-hmm. it would be more uh, instructive, informational, if we had a little bit of more of a drama to it. Something like Chewy, like have a danzante perform a danza while someone is sort of telling a story about what what the danza represents and how it's connected to the community and the culture. Kind of like the way uh, we discussed the acequias and how there's the danzas and the songs that go, mm-hmm. that connect to the acequia and, 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 and actually explain the meaning behind what it means, you know, to have this danza and how it's important for the community. Something like that, right? Yeah. Well, that's really similar to what um, our grupo here in uh, Albuquerque does. And I haven't danced like, you know, in a demonst- like, you know, a performance or a cultural demonstration, whatever you want to t- uh, call it, in a very long time. But when I was doing it all the time, the way that we would structure, <clears throat> excuse me, the way that we would structure these uh, events was there would be an introduction, they'd introduce the group, and then it would be explained that what we're doing right now is not ceremony that we're not doing the full versions of the dances that we're not going to do like all of the protocols and everything. Cause that's reserved for ceremony. What we're doing is a, a, a cultural demonstration. Mm-hmm. And then the dances were set, like we would do specific dances. And then the dances were done in a way where, you know, there would be a, a dance called, um, ah, oh man, but what were they? Cause we did them all in a certain order because it was telling a story. So there was like Guerrero, right? Right. And then one of the warriors would die at the end of Guerrero. And then Mictlán Tecutli would come out and do a dance around the, the fallen warrior. And then we would dance Aguila Blanca. And it would like bring the warrior and, and the female warrior together. So it was all done in a very um, kind of theatrical storytelling yeah. way. Yeah, and very theatrical. And the point was, is like, these are, this tradition comes from, you know, and, 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 uh, our, our capitan would talk about Florencio Yescas and Andres Segura right. and how these traditions were brought to the United States and given to Chicanos. And so it's, it sounds real similar to what you're talking about, which in retrospect, you know, at the time, I don't think I appreciated mm-hmm. it the way I, I, I should have as being the way you're describing it, because, you know, I was really young at the time and I'm like, we should be doing ceremony, <laughs> blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like, why are we dancing at Super events? Mexica. But Exactly. But now that I look back on it, I'm like, damn, that's that's actually really dope <laughs> the way right. that that it was done. And it did bring people in like it brought new people to the grupo, too, who were like, wow, that was powerful. That was beautiful. And, you know, thank you for doing this. And it's like you said, people start to lose interest if it's like, OK, well. Now it's your danza. Yeah. Now they're gonna dance the permiso, and now right. they, and you know what I mean. And it's the same same thing over and over and over again, and all the paso. So like when we do the public demonstrations, you only do each paso once, once, right, and not twice. Yeah, because you really want to talk about taking up a lot of time, right? Exactly. And those things are important. You know, the protocol is important. 
the structure is important for ceremony, for ceremonial purposes. But when you're out in public or you're, you're part of a protest even, right? Mm-hmm. You can't mm-hmm. shut down the whole protest while you have your whole, you danza. know, danza. <laughs> you have to incorporate yourself into it. You have to weave yourself into it. And I think that makes it more... Um, maybe not more impactful, but it makes it impactful in a way that allows more people to be drawn in, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got yeah, a low-flying airplane over here. I know, I hear that. I was going to say, they're coming for you, Curly. You need to duck and hide. Go to your safe space. <laughs> right. <laughs> the panic room. The fascists are coming. Yeah. That's cool what, what your group was doing. I mean, I'm sure they still do that, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty much the way it's... I mean, they've, they've probably adapted it over the years, but that's pretty much what, what they've done. And, and that's cool. And, and I've seen that before. And I think that our group for a while, like, we, we used to do that um, a lot more, I think, than, than we do now as, as a group. But it's still not the same as, like, you know, actually telling a story where it's not just yeah where you're not just dancing like one after the other like you're telling a story you're weaving the story together and you're explaining to the audience like what this is all about and you're telling the story and and maybe and what i was telling evelio was that maybe we could do something where because he has uh, he has this thing where when we do the dances in public like he'll um explain you know do a little brief explanation like either halfway through or maybe at the end before the friendship dance and 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 you know or, or sometimes i do it i've done it too as well i will explain to the public the, the meaning behind the dance what is the purpose how it survived and etc and i'm thinking wouldn't it be cool to tell that story but at the same time that we're doing the dance as as the show itself not as like it's narrative text separate from from yeah, the dance yeah, itself. yeah i get what you're saying so that's something that, that I'm kind of leaning towards. And if, you know, the Santas out there, other groups that are listening to this, I don't know how many Santas out there listen to us, but if, if you're out there listening to <laughs> us, you know, um, that would be cool. And, you know, uh, send us a link if, if y'all ever end up doing something like that. Um, but, you know, how do you feel about Danza competitions? Because when we were doing this, we were getting a lot of pushback earlier. This is 2017. So the first year we did it, um, we got a significant amount of pushback from people who the main concern, the main complaint or criticism that we got from Danzantes was that the danza was not supposed to be competitive. And 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 we get that. I mean, I understand this this idea that the danza is supposed to be about collective unity and because it's a prayer, you know, if, if you hold fast mm-hmm. to, to that notion that the danza is a prayer, then you're going to have a problem with doing it for a, a competitive purpose and and getting a monetary reward. But I'm thinking, but isn't the danza, even even though it's a prayer, isn't it also a competition among danzantes too? I'll I'll tell you Come what, on, man. man. If you've let's, ever let's if honest. you've ever done let's be honest. if you've ever done danza <laughs> in the Socalo in in Mexico City, you want to talk about competition. I mean, people go all out yeah. to show how much better they are exactly at certain danzas than the people next to them or maybe this grupo is trying to outshine that grupo. or maybe even people within the same grupo you know you have these yep. dancers who are like super athletic and super agile and i think we've kind of brought this up before but not in this context right but but it's like they forget one of the main lessons that i remember when when i first started in the dance was that you're supposed to be doing it in unison collectively as a group exactly and then you hit you got this one cat that is like <laughs> super athletic and like doing all of these crazy spins and jumping up in the air and it's like did you forget about everybody else yeah uh, yeah and he makes circle? he keeps telling the drummer to speed it up speed, speed it up, up so it sounds like a machine gun right exactly. da, 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 da. it's like you you lose the you lose the beat because it, it after a while when you're drumming so fast it's like there's no the beat is gone it's just da, 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 like yeah, it's saying, indistinguishable it's just, it's like the bosses themselves anything. Each right. paso becomes indistinguishable. And and the older that I've gotten, the more that I've I've thought about this and you know, especially going back to the research that I did for my article on, on the history of Lanza and the Concheros, the more appreciation that I have for the Conchero way of doing it, which yeah. is slower paced, 
And one of the things that the, the, our, our teacher, Daniel, you remember him, right? Yeah. He, he would tell us that the Lanzantes Concheros, because he comes from that tradition, is that they mar they say, ellos marcan el paso. They, they, they make a point to, to, to really mark the step that they're doing to, to, to show you as you're dancing and to those around them what they're doing. It's not about who's the fastest, who's the quickest, uh, etc. It's about are you doing the step the right yeah. way? And are you keeping with the beat, right? And don't get me wrong. It is super impressive to see somebody who can mark each step while dancing super fast and athletic. Like, that's pretty impressive. You know, I'm not going to lie. I'll see some of these danzantes, you know, at ceremonies or whatever. And I'm like, damn, that dude can really, really dance this dance really yeah. well. But that's not the purpose of the ceremony, right? Right. Is, is to be to outshine everybody else. So, so, so when, when we proposed this idea with, uh, with the Mieka and Garzas, with Maria and, and Dr. Garza, like that was, that, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking this would be the moment for those danzantes that are exactly. super athletic, that, that are very good at, at the danzas, to really shine and to really, if, and if they want to compete, if they want to show the world, you know, um, Now's your chance. How good, how good of a danzante <laughs> that they are! This is your chance. Exactly. And if and if you have what it takes, you're gonna be, you know, selected as the winner. And so we ended up doing that. And so 2018 rolls around, and I think you know I didn't I didn't attend that powwow. Uh, I think I was busy. Uh, I forget what I think that, was that when I was in El Paso. No, actually, no, I did. I did show up because I, I did a presentation on the history of Cobaltecans in Texas at the 2018 powwow. And it was, and they had the competition again, if I'm not mistaken. But I think 2019, there was a little bit of, of a falling out with some of the, the grupos because they felt like some, you know, when you get into a competition and and you feel like the, the judges aren't judging correctly or you feel like maybe there's a little bit of favoritism that's going on. Uh, some of the danzantes that were there in 2017 and 2018 didn't really were were not very enthusiastic about the the whole process. So 2019 didn't have a huge turnout for for the danza Azteca competitions, if I remember correctly. But then we had the pandemic, and so it's been a couple of years since we've had anything. Yeah, and so I know that the the, the this year they're gonna have the the power uh, in in person again and. Have you heard any talk about any danza competitions being so included I, well, this year? Since I'm doing uh, like the marketing and graphic design for it, I asked explicitly like, hey, so what should I be including in all of the marketing materials to, to get interest? And so the powwow this year is October 1st and 2nd. And well, that's sooner than it's been. Yeah. And it's in uh, the Meadows Center in San Marcos, Texas. And there will be danzantes there, but not a competition. I think they're trying to start up, start back up slowly. Okay. And uh, so they told me like, yeah, there, there will be danzantes, but we're not going to have a specific separate competition. So, you know, and it is what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that historically speaking, I mean, if you go back and you look at the sources, uh, on on powwows and danza and how they begin to intersect, you could you really begin to see that, especially like during the the red power and the and the brown power Chicano movement days, uh, with some of the early danzantes, you begin to see danzantes present at the powwows by the mid seventies, uh, in places out in like in I'm sure New Mexico, California, and in Texas, you begin to see um, there's there's danzantes present at powwows mm -hmm. but again this is where that tradition begins where they're sort of kind of like the sideshow or even if they're given uh, a modicum of respect you know they're they're still kind of like separate they're, they're not identified as being a part of the greater native american mm -hmm. dance community they're kind of like separate oh and look now we have the aztec dancers from the south our brothers from the south and it, it, there's always been like the separation the partition yeah, this partitioning, you know, this building of that wall between, <laughs> you know, American Indians and Native people from south of the border. And so 
you know, when I first envisioned this this idea of, of having uh, a powwow for danzantes and for people south of the border, that was kind of like my reaction to what I had experienced as a drummer in the powwow community. This, mm -hmm. this sort of... Uh, well, you know, I'm generalizing because there's always exceptions to, to everything. So I did, I mean, the people that, that I drum with were very accepting of me and, and I was part of that community. But that's kind of like the way it works. Unless you know people yeah. and you get accepted into that group, everyone else just kind of sees you like, eh, whatever. You know, kind of like the, the anecdote that, yeah, that I, yeah. that I mentioned those. In, in the article. You know, <laughs> you're one of those guys. You know, like, okay, well, what, what does that mean? You know? Yeah. Like, do you not recognize me as an indigenous person because I don't have a BIA card and a government approved Indian yeah. card? You're a bona fide Indian because the government stamp says of so. Approval. The stamp of approval by by the government, you know, and, and how how weird is that, right? To to have people who maybe not back then, but now I'm, I'm thinking of more in the current moment where you have people who proclaim to be decolonizing and to be anti this and anti that, and and for self determination of indigenous people, for tribal sovereignty, uh, while at the same time sort of policing people's identity gatekeeping and, mm -hmm. and telling people you can be an Indian if you if you meet the these certain requirements. You're not an, a real Indian if you're not, you know, if you don't have that checklist yeah. and, and mark all the proper boxes. I mean how how absurd is that? And it's kind of like the kinds of reactions that I was getting back then when I was in the powwow trail are kind of very these what's happening today is sort of like a progression of that. And and I don't know if it's getting worse or if this is just because of the current moment that, that we're in where people are just getting meaner and nastier, especially on social media. I don't know if maybe that's part of it, the, the, the trend. I don't think I don't know if it's getting worse, but I do think that social media has empowered and enabled the most vocal people to um, always be out there talking shit. Right. And the people who like, you know, here in New Mexico, when you when you meet natives who do recognize chicanos as indigenous people it's usually something like oh yeah yeah our you know we have a story that we're like we're cousins or we're related but these aren't the same people that are going to jump on twitter 24 7 you know saying chicanos are indigenous you know because that's mm -hmm. not their thing they've got better things to do but the, exactly <laughs> but the people who have too much time on their hands who all they want to do is shit on uh and gatekeep and police identities they're the ones that are gonna i don't know if they don't have jobs or what but they spend a <laughs> lot of time on the internet <laughs> talking shit when i would think that they they could have better things to do with their time yeah you would think but what you said um so we have this malinche exhibit and we had mentioned this you know when we were talking about it before but i want to reiterate this quote that i saw in one of the art pieces at the at the Malinche exhibit here in Albuquerque, and if you live in Albuquerque, I think it's here until September, so you should go check it out. It's at the Albuquerque Museum. There's a modern piece, and it says in Spanish, Los Chicanos también son indios como yo. And I had to take a picture of it because I was like, hell yeah. I, I, I just, hmm. even, you know, not just that little, that little quote, which was a part of a, a much larger piece of art but this piece of art um i don't know like sometimes you hear a song or you, you hear a poem or you see a a piece of artwork or a movie that just kind of makes you well with pride a little bit swell with pride right yeah, you're just like, yeah. hell yeah and you, and you feel good like this this image made me feel good like i i walked out of that exhibit feeling good that day so you know, and and, nice. and and I appreciate that, and and I, I think it's great. But wouldn't it be better if we had something with that same message coming from the Sacagawea? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that would be more <laughs> to the point that we're trying to make. Because Malinche, you know, she's part of the Mexican indigenous tradition, and so someone could say, "Well, yeah, she would say something like that, I guess, because she's Mexican." Yeah. Well, within the context of this art piece, it is a northern native woman. Who's, they're they're like having a conversation, and uh, uh, you'd have okay, to see okay. it. It's a yeah. it's it's a, an entire story that's being told. It's like a modern codex that you have to read through the entire thing, 
and like these discussions that are happening between northern natives and southern natives. It's it's really mm-hmm. powerful. It's really cool. But I have a question about the the powwow. So what's the um like what was the criteria that was developed? Like was it okay, everybody's going to dance a hekat now and whoever dances a hekat the best or like how was the uh how was it set up? I'm trying to remember. So so okay, so it, it, those of you that have attended powwows and have seen the competitions know that like you have a group of dancers that are all dancing to the same song that's being played by by the the drum the center drum and then you know they have their their parameters usually they judge them based on whether they're on beat did they stop on time with the last drum beat um how well were they keeping up with the drum uh, the steps and 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 then you also have uh, I don't know if the judging is separate or it could be included in the same ju- judging for for the uh, the okay. regalia, right? And so we took we took some of the same parameters that are used in traditional powwow um, judging judging of, of the dancers, um, and so we had the we had the different categories. We had the men's, women's, boys, and girls. And it was just basically those four that I remember. Um, and so for the men, you know, I forget which time. I have it documented somewhere. I should have pulled it out for the, for the episode, and I, and I didn't. But we had um, each each category had its own danza that they danced to. And so we basically judged them on the regalia. We judged them on whether or not they knew the steps uh, not that everyone, because you know, different groups have different yeah, yeah. steps that they add, or but there's always kind of there's, there's the like base, there's always the base, there's always to the to a the core dance. element, and and if you add to it, then that's great. But but there's always a core set of steps, and so we were looking for the the core set of steps for the, for the danzas. How well that did they uh, actually mark the steps, and not and weren't weren't just kind of like flying through the and running through the danza. Um, and also, uh, we tried as best as we could to also like if see if they were going to stop on time when when the, when the lanza stops as well. Kind of like trying to keep up with the tradition mm-hmm. of the power, right? And so that's how we did it. And we had the category for the women and, and etc. And for the for the kids, I remember that for the kids we, there wasn't that many kids. Um, I think we, uh, the first year we might have had like like two or three, and so. Because you have adults uh, and you have minors who look like adults, I think that we had we had the the the, the cutoff was at like twelve, if I'm not mistaken, for 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 the for the kids, for the boys and girls, and then anyone under twelve, that's kind of like like the mm-hmm. tots, right? The tiny tots dance, and and they they got a chance to showcase you know what they know, and they all got like a little present or something. I think we gave them like toys or something. So it was actually five categories, four of which were monetary awards, and one was for the for yeah, toys for the for the, for the tots. Kids. That's really yeah. cool. So, do they know what the dance is in advance, or do you, they just start drumming it and then it's like you got to figure no, it out? Thank you, thank you for reminding me. I think I think the way that we did it was that that they had to within, and that's one of the things we we judged them on. How soon would they recognize the danza? And so if they went. More than than two, I guess, stances yeah. of the danza, then that was points off because they, that means that they they took them a while to yeah. And it's usually danza. two, even in ceremony, right? You you, you let it's it go through before, you're before you start, start everybody yeah. with 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 before your you dance. Start. So yeah, that's a good that's right. a good rule. That makes yeah. sense. So so I hope I hope that that the the Sacred Springs powwow brings it back. Me too. Um, I guess this year is not going to be it, but maybe next year and, and the following year we can start. You know, building um, that part of the the powwow more. Yeah, I mean, it sounds really cool, man. And I, you know, thank you for doing this. Thank you for getting that started. Like, I appreciate that about you, man. That you got this done. I think that's badass. Well, you're welcome. I, I didn't do. It, I had the idea, and it took. <laughs> well, yeah, a bunch yeah, of us but to, I mean, you know, you had you had the idea. That's that's what set it all in motion. So, thank you for that. That's uh, I'm proud of you, man. That's badass. Oh, cool. Thanks. That means a lot, man. That's very cool. And, you know, for people listening, 
some sometimes people get it twisted and they think that just because we're critical of things that like we don't participate in these things it's like i'm critical of the things because i love them and i want to see the you know i want to see them done in a respectful way like danza i do danza i'm a part of a of a danza circle i enjoy doing danza and so don't get it twisted listeners and say that i'm anti danzante <laughs> or something i am a danzante so <laughs> I just I I yeah. just want to see it done, you know, in a way that's respectful of our history and not embellished with a bunch of new age, you know, pseudo nonsense. Yep. That's that's all. Being critical doesn't mean that we're anti or against exactly. it. Exactly. It just means that we're being critical of it because we want to we're voicing our opinion on the things that we we find problematic. Yeah. Not necessarily wrong because we're not saying that we're right, exactly. but we find certain things problematic and they need to be addressed uh, as far as we're concerned and they you know it's up to each group or each individual that's on santa that's part of this community to uh, you know if they listen to us to to take what we're saying and and assess it for themselves you know we're not telling them what to do we're not telling anyone what to do this is just our opinion and this is our you know assessment of things as we see them exactly well i think this has been a good talk man and, uh, it has been all of our listeners I want to thank everyone out there who's taken the time out of their day to listen to this to these two guys prattle on about our life experiences and our thoughts if you want to support the show visit talesfromastlantis.com or chimali.org and sign up to become a Patreon supporter you'll get ad free episodes you'll get access to our premium episodes You'll get access to our Discord community. You'll be able to buy merch and uh, just, you know, support independent indigenous Chicano media because we always say representation is important and it is, but, you know, we got to represent ourselves too. That's right. And you can also follow the podcast on Twitter at Aslantis Tales. And you have, uh, what is it, uh, the Instagram and other social medias that, that you run yep uh, and I'm Curly Tlapoyawa on Twitter Ruben Ariano Tlacateca you can find me as at Tlacateca and remember folks the truth well it's like medicine it doesn't always taste good but it's always good for you Te Aue Mexica Te Moitase Addendum the first publication that cites my piece, Aztecas at the Powwow, is that of Jessica Margarita Gutierrez Massini, and it's a master's thesis out of the University of California, Riverside, from December of 2018, entitled Native American Indigeneity Through Danza in University of California Powwows, A Decolonized Approach. And the abstract of this thesis is as follows. Since the mid-1970s, the indigenous ritual dance known as danza has had a profound impact on the self-identification and concept of space in Chicana communities, but how is this practice received in the powwow space? My project broadly explores how student-organized powwows at UC Davis, UC Riverside, and UC San Diego are decolonizing spaces for teaching and learning about Native American identities. Drawing on Beverly Diamond's Alliance Studies approach, which illuminates the importance of social relationships across space and time, as well as my engagement in these powwows, I trace real and imagined connections between danza and powwow cultures. Today, powwows are intertribal social events organized by communities and coordinated with their local native communities. Powwows not only have restorative abilities to create community for those who perform, attend, and coordinate them, but they are only a small glimpse of the broader social political networks that take place throughout the powwow circuit. By inviting and opening the powwow space to indigeneity across borders, the University of California not only accurately reflects its own native student body that puts on the event, but speaks to changing understandings of Native Americanists by people both north and south of the United States border. 
Ultimately, I argue, an alliance studies approach to ethnography and community-based methodologies in music research are crucial, especially in the case of indigenous communities who are committed to the survival and production of cultural knowledge embedded in music and dance practices. And in this piece, she cites my article, Aztecas in the Powwow, on page 56, uh, and this is what she says in that paragraph. Traditional, more community-based powwows may continue exclusionary sentiments that deny access to danza groups. However, in the last decade, powwows like UCRs have welcomed danzantes in both grand entry and inner tribal songs. And UCR, I believe, is uh, UC Riverside. Following Cuauhtémoc's productive dialogue, which is a danzante that she interviewed, a person by the name of Cuauhtémoc, and so this is who she's citing here. Following Cuauhtémoc's productive dialogue, I see powwows as powerful spaces for reconciliation and coexistence between local Native American communities. They may not agree on who belongs or protocol. However, I've personally witnessed how incorporating danza at powwows inspires students to go back and learn their roots. Ultimately, our main goal as a powwow committee is to support Native American education and survivance. Over time, regional practices become integrated and part of the local powwow traditions. I hope to see more danza powwows like the first ever in San Marcos, Texas, where danzantes compete in their own exhibition dances. And that's, that's where she cites uh, my article. In this way, they are not perceived as dinner entertainment, but recognized and rewarded like any other competitive dancer in the powwow circuit. The second publication that cites my piece is out of the European Journal of Social Sciences Studies, Volume 7, Issue 3 from the year 2022, this year, essentially. Uh, and it's by Guillermo Bartel uh, out of California State University, Northridge. And it's entitled... Ah, you're one of those ethnic boundaries in urban powwows. And this is the abstract, and it's kind of short. The inclusion of Aztec dancing as an assertion of native identity within the space of North American Indian gatherings called powwows is often contested for not meeting expectations of criteria such as official tribal recognition. And uh, that's kind of very generic, but let's go ahead and skip down to where he cites me in a few places uh, and so overall uh, he's kind of looking at the the notion of contested identities and this is uh, a section by that name and I'm going to start with the uh, the top paragraph the invited presence of danza in the powwow space would appear as an unequivocal attempt to broaden the definition of North American indigeneity to include those Chicanos who choose to identify with their native bloodlines. In fact, one of the past powwows held in the Cornfield Historic Park near downtown Los Angeles, themed Northern and Southern Winds, was ostensibly dedicated to an appeal to coalition building between natives of both hemispheres. Yet Chicano nativeness is not as tangible of an identity marker as that of members of federally recognized tribes such as the Lakota, Kiowa, or Navajo who have been assigned official tribal enrollment numbers and identification cards for the drawing of government benefits. Many if not most Chicanos possess only fragmentary family information regarding the Mexican Indian civilization from which they might descend. Thus, in following the ideology of indigenismo, Many, especially those involved in danza, have embraced a constructed form of Mexica selfhood. And this is where he cites me. However, that presentation of self, as reported by Ruben Arellano, a seasoned danza participant as well as a veteran singer with a Southern Plains drum, can be bluntly derailed by those who regard themselves as the quote-unquote real Indians and who look with suspicion on unverifiable claims of indigeneity. And then he goes on to cite a couple of lines of my article, especially where I uh, am having that anecdotal conversation with the, the gentleman who asked me what tribe I was from. And then after that, he goes on to say, Regarding this encounter, Arellano laments with some bitterness that his sense of indigeneity was not just called into question, but was, in his opinion, dismissed altogether. Claiming that this was not an isolated incident in his experience, he is convinced that the seeming pan-indigenous unity hinted at in some powwow discourse is tenuous at best. 
A similar interaction rattled Jessica Gutierrez, a Chicana graduate student in ethnomusicology who involved herself as a volunteer for the annual University of California of Riverside Powell, which now he's citing Massini or Jessica Gutierrez's thesis that I just mentioned right before I started talking about this publication. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting um, little uh, sort of analysis f from his point of view, Bartel. And then the next time he cites me, he says, One of the complaints from Danza participants concerns their resentment of having their performances relegated to the dinner break, even though the length of their sessions does not permit convenient insertion at any other time. Nevertheless, Ruben Ariano is seemingly offended by that inflexibility. And then he quotes me, uh, quote, as a proud danzante, I had long grown tired of danza being disrespected as if it were merely a low-budget traveling circus act solely there for the purpose of entertainment while the crowds break for the fry bread and Indian taco stands, end quote. Exasperated arena directors point out that the gourd dance, which also lasts at least an hour, is scheduled separately as well, always before the start of the main powwow event and certainly before most spectators arrive. However, the feeling of marginalization is not shared by gourd dancers since their prestigious society dedicated to veterans originates from an ancient warrior sodalities of the Southern Plains and is always robustly represented at an urban power. So there you have it. Chicanos, it's time to give it up. Apparently we've been discovered. We're not really real Indians um, because, I mean, if I'm reading this right, According to Bartel, real Indians are people who are government-recognized, BIA-recognized indigenous people. If you look at his conclusion, if you read his conclusion, I mean, it's uh, he's basically telling on himself. It's a clue as to his bias. And uh, it's a, it's a one-paragraph conclusion, so I'll just go ahead and read it. This is a short, quote-unquote, article of eight pages. Uh, and so this is what he says in his conclusion, just to kind of give you a sense of where this guy Bartel is coming from. He says, influenced by the Mexican ideology of indigenismo, which was especially espoused during the protest era of the 1960s, many Chicanos choose to identify as natives of the greater North American continent. Participating in danza is an assertion of that identity in social as well as aesthetic terms and performing it as a special presentation at powwow symbolizes a reaching out to members of the American Indian tribes. Though the invited presence of danza in the powwow space appears to broaden the definition of North American indigeneity, ethnographic data seem to indicate that there are opponents who consider such seemingly manufactured quote-unquote tribes as Mexica an unwelcome crossing of an ethnic boundary. As an identity marker, Chicano nativeness simply does not meet American Indian expectations of verifiable criteria such as federal recognition and tribal enrollment. Thus, a true intercultural collaboration between danza and powwow is still tenuous but may increase as individuals begin to participate in both practices. Such can already be observed among a few dancers from California, Indian bands, and rancherias, among whom intermarriage with Hispanics has taken place for many generations and for whom navigating a dual identity is familiar ground. So it's kind of hard to gauge this guy. Like on, on the one hand, he seems to be sympathetic to the Chicano cause and the Chicano uh, sentiment of, uh, you know, identifying with your indigenous ancestors. And on the other hand, he comes across as being uberly critical of Chicanos and danza and their claims of indigeneity because, uh, I mean, as he stresses in several points in this paper, people who are truly indigenous uh, have some kind of federal recognition from the United States government and are enrolled in a U.S. recognized tribe. So uh, apparently, if I'm, if I'm, maybe I'm reading this incorrectly, but what I gather from what he's saying is that, you know, using my own words, tenuous, you know, Chicano indigeneity is tenuous at best is what he's trying to say. Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromatlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. 
Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, Timo Itase.